Good morning, this is Sandra Peters. I'd like to, um, as we always do from the Muscogee Creek Nation, uh, seek our Creator uh, for a blessing upon this uh, particular study. Father God, thank you for the day. Thank you for calling it into order. Thank you for the purity of it and the sweet hours laid before us for our labor. Thank you for our nation and keeping our tribe strong and resourceful. May we today learn the wisdom of your perfect, divine, and ancient calling. You are the spirit of the spirits, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hello, my name is Sandra Peters from Travel Administration. And as we go into the content of our Muscogee History course, I would like to introduce a speaker from our archives. Philip Deere is a traditional healer from New Yaka Ground, Okima, Oklahoma, who became a spiritual leader, an oral historian, and a storyteller. He speaks about remembering traditional values, Muscogee prophecies, and the care for Mother Earth. He brought attention in the 70s to injustices suffered by indigenous people of the Americas. He quotes this saying, life, the circle, a measurement with no beginning and no end. And now we'll hear from Philip Deere to tell you about the creation story. The word Muskogee is our original names and not the Creeks. The Creek word, the word Creek was never used until later years, probably somewhere in 1800s. But prior to that, we were called Muskogee. And from the very beginning of times, our, word, our name Muskogee was a longer word Muskogee is only a short word for our tribe. Our tribe's name was Masi Aksokche, which means those who possesses herbs. <clears throat> At one time, somewhere in the West, the earth opened its mouth. Three groups of people came out of this earth and <clears throat> went West. When they went further west, they lived in the land of fog, the land that covered with fog. The sun was never seen, or nor did they see one another in speaking to, one, to each other. Because of the thickness of the fog, they never could see one another clear. One day, the wind came and blew the fog away. And the first animal that was seen by my people, they became that clan. And the first animal that was seen was the bear. So that group became the bear clan, which has a lot to do with tradition, ceremonies, that we have our ceremonial grounds. All these clans has a lot to do with it, down to this date. The bear clan was originated there, and many others, birds, deers, and all kinds of animal clans were originated there. Since the wind came and blew the fog away, the wind clan had a position in the tribe. I am of the wind clan. My father was a bear clan. And therefore, I was chosen to hold a position, not by the people, not by election, not by, a, by appointment, does one become a medicine man. A medicine man is observed from his birth own up until certain age by the older medicine man. If he is qualified to become a medicine man, then he begins training at early age. Different herbs are told to him what they are good for. And as time goes by, he begins to pick up more and more from the older medicine man. And then he never goes out to publish himself or to announce himself. By his actions and by his looks, by his ways, he is judged as a medicine man. Then someday someone will come to him for medicine, and he prepares a medicine for this person. Then later on, he becomes well known to the tribe. He never steps out to tell you that he knows this and he knows that. All of his knowledge is kept in secret in, in his heart. Even his children 
never learns everything from his father, even though he is a medicine man. <clears throat> Getting back to our story of the creation. In this land, everything was filthy. Everything was dirty. Nothing was clean. The only clean thing that eyes could see was the sun coming up from the east. So my people decided to go see where the sun was coming from because it was so bright and that was the only cleanest thing that could be seen. So they traveled east and they went as far as to a river, a red, thick, slimy river in which they could not cross. So they followed the river to another river that joined this river. In between the two rivers, there was a mountain that thundered all the time and red smoke came from the top of this mountain. They stood there at this mountain and saw a post beneath this mountain that shook all the time. And by the directions of the elders, they picked out a motherless child and slammed it against this pole and the pole stopped. And then they gained the knowledge of herbs. Four herbs was introduced to my tribe, one known as the red willow root, the other snake root, and the other spice wood. Also, the small leaf tobacco was given to them at the foot of this mountain. Here they began to possess the herbs for healing and for many other things. Here they obtained the first fire which was given to them by the Creator. Then they went east again. They took the pole with them, and the pole gave them directions which way to travel. And there is no telling how many years, maybe hundreds of years, they traveled, camping at certain areas and following the directions of this pole. Many customs and traditions that we have today were picked up on this journey. <clears throat> While traveling east, whichever way the pole fell, that's the directions that they took. And they traveled all the way to the east coast. Every morning, it was a custom by my people that they get up before the sun came up because they were going to seek, see the sun. Going to the mountains, they stood on the top of the mountain. And in ancient language, they cried out, Go Hashida, Go Hashida, which means, Where is the sun? And that group of people became the Kasista people. And we identify these people today. Their descendants live around the vicinity of Okmulgi. Some three or four hundred, or maybe more, of the first people's descendants still live with us now. We want to thank the Muscogee Creek Nation archives for the video of Philip Deer. I'd like now to go into some of the migration patterns uh, into North America. Our creator taught the ancient Muscogee the currents are the passageways through the ocean. We never lost our fire in which their spiritual knowledge and wisdom was passed from generation to generation. The Europeans or the Spanish believed that if you sailed far enough, you would fall off the face of the earth. Now Columbus, who was a Christian, was informed by our ancestors that there was a water route or a highway to the continents and that was the earth was round and not flat. These currents or passageways run consistently over the oceans. The currents are fed by the winds and brought our ancestors to North America through these highways. The Muscogee have always maintained their fire, their faith, and the spirit through the Creator's order in the universe. And we want to thank the uh, College of the Muscogee for putting together the curriculum for us today. Uh, I hope you enjoy the information. We will go through the table of contents for you so that you'll have an idea of what we're going to be studying today. We'll be discussing uh, some of the pre-removal, uh, some of the background of the Muscogee people, uh, the Creek Confederacy as it was uh, in the early, early days, uh, the features of the historic Creek town, the locations of the Muscogee towns and the matriarchal society that it was and clans. 
we'll be talking about some of the creek trading and the treaties, uh, some of the land secessions that we uh, also uh, gave up during these times. Uh, we're going to be discussing some of the outside influences and effects of the war, uh, some of the forced removal information. We're going into Indian Territory and arriving in uh, Indian Territory. Uh, we'll be discussing some pre-war between the states and the effects of that war uh, uh, on the Muscogee Nation. We're going to be talking about the rebuilding after the war and uh, we're going to be s discussing Creek schools and political parties, uh, some pre-allotment and the effects of that allotment, those that oppose the allotment and pre-statehood. We'll also be discussing the early tribal government, uh, the 1867 Constitution, uh, considerations relating to our Constitution at that time, uh, proposal for an Indian state and pre-statehood, uh, the Oklahoma Indian Welfare Act, and the contemporary tribal government. We're going to be discussing some things like that. For you that are not history buffs, we'll try to make it uh, interesting uh, as well as um, uh, complete history for you. Um, we're going to be discussing our tribal constitution in the uh, 1970s uh, with uh, Chief Cox, the tribal government under the new constitution and the differences between the 1867 and the, and the 1979 constitution. And we'll also be discussing the principal chiefs since 1971 and our tribal operations uh, today. And now we're going to discuss the pre-removal period of the Muscogee Confederacy. The Muscogee have always been in the traditional homelands in the southeast for thousands of years. Uh, Spanish explorers traveled in the region. They were impressed with the Muscogee's uh, good-looking people and large towns and prosperous countrysides. Uh, the earliest uh, with Swanson and Bartram and some of the travels, uh, they mentioned how handsome the Muscogee people were. The men were tall and, and uh, strong, and the women were petite and small. Uh, they ate the very best foods, vegetables from the fields, and they ate herbs. Um, they were prescribed from their medicine men to live lives of, uh, of happiness and love for one another. Uh, they also were forgiving people, and they had a servant's heart. Those are the things that traditional people understood. Um, the archaeological time periods were the Swift Creek through Mississippian period, 100 AD, and the mid-late 1500s AD. For you that are Christians, the 100 AD, of course, would be uh, less than 60 or 70 years uh, from the time of Christ's crucifixion. However, our people go back to ancient times prior to that period. The Swift Creek Woodland period were where the mound builders began and the complicated stamped uh, pottery, ceramics uh, that you see. Uh, they were uh, during this period and the Mississippian mound builders uh, who made the Georgettes and the shell tempered ceramic ware, copper ware and complex sedimentary villages. Uh, our Copperware was what the Muscogee Creek people used for decoration in their jewelry. Uh, they did not have uh, the silver at that time. That came later with the Spanish when they arrived. Uh, there was the Cusa chiefdom, and also from chiefdoms of the Tolova. We had mother towns and daughter towns. There were red towns and white towns. The red towns uh, primarily were war towns, and the white towns were peace towns. In the 1700s, Europeans started calling the Muscogee Creeks because they resided near rivers and streams and creeks. You can see on the PowerPoint uh, um, the setup of a Muscogee village. Uh, you can see that the town square consisted of an, an open area surrounded by terraces and banks, uh, which was representative of the creek's ability to incorporate culture and to the design. You can also see the circular mound top with a rotunda where um, uh, primarily the leaders of our tribe uh, would situate their homes, uh, their grandparents, their sisters or their brothers, they were leaders and those that were relative to them uh, also had uh, homes that were built on uh, top of rotundas. 
the square terrace upon which the public square stood, you can see that there are also uh, the river, uh, as you see, running through the village, and uh, uh, there is many fish traps on those rivers. If you go to Etowah uh, in uh, uh, Georgia, uh, the Etowah River uh, will show as many as 100 fish traps on that river and the six-story high mound that's built there by Muscogee people. Uh, you can see that the residential buildings uh, in Creek Towns mirrored the organization of the public square also. The family plots that you see there consist of small compounds of up to four homes and there may be more. Family plots um, uh, also had probably a small garden uh, which they uh, gathered their, their crops from, but they also had on the other side of the river, generally speaking, a large, large agri-area that was a communal uh, garden for all the village uh, and all of the people to um, uh, receive vegetables from and to work in those fields. Uh, they had large fields of corn, beans, squash, and other vegetables. And they bartered uh, much with other tribes and travel long distances to barter uh, for other items from other tribes and to uh, give their vegetables away. The locations of the Muscogee towns uh, were, uh, as you can see uh, on the uh, slide, uh, the Upper Creeks, they lived along the Coosa and Tallapoosa rivers in Alabama. And many upper towns were close to Fort Toulouse and supported the French. The Upper Creeks uh, did intermingle with the French. The French were the first to come into our territory as white. And um, many of our uh, Muscogee people intermarried in uh, to the French people. And uh, we have many uh, of our uh, ancestors today that ha have Creek names like Charlie Lesarge. The Lower Creeks, they lived along the Flint and the Chattahoochee Rivers in Georgia. And many lower towns were friendly to Florida and were friendly to the Spanish. The Seminole Nation, which speaks the same dialect that we do in Muscogee, were part of Muscogee people. They were more of a uh, a traveling uh, group that would, uh, was an offshoot of the Muscogee people. They have the same language uh, and the same dialects. The social structure uh, that we had of our nation, as we speak of it as today, uh, it was a matriarchal society and we also had clans. Um, it is not unusual to see uh, clans from many parts of the world today. We have uh, the Irish clans, and we have tribes that are in Africa. Uh, we have tribes uh, all over, and some of the tribes uh, around the, the world have lost their identity. But in the Muscogee Nation, we have been able to keep our uh, identity as Muscogee people with clans and tribes. The women were considered the heads of the household. And within that Creek society, women held a most prominent place Females, as head of households, owned the homes and the land. And the towns consisted of groups of houses owned by women. Their daughters built houses on family land or nearby after they were married, and they retained their mother's uh, clan. Creek clans were dispersed through several communities in each town containing members of several clans. The clan's identity influenced where members lived as clan members' houses were generally located together in a household group. We're going to take a break now and we're going to continue with our next video 